writing this talk was a really interesting opportunity for me to kind of think what it was actually that um, that I could try and pick out of the idea of radical hope and culture and um, how cultures falter, how they fail. Because our culture is in a really weird place. It's a unique place. Ours is one of the very few cultures there's ever been which has the information to look back at the long past and see the principle that civilizations can falter and fail. The Roman Empire, Egyptian civilization, those are the big two in the history books. But we also know that there have been countless indigenous cultures which, following invasion and land loss, have found their cultures dying, their languages extinct, and all the wisdoms and knowledges of those languages holding entire worlds of culture gone. Jared Diamond remarked that the population decline among native people in the century or two following Columbus's arrival is thought to have been up to 95%. When I was writing my book, Wild, I was in the Peruvian Amazon for some time and I saw and heard very close up about one of the ways in which a culture can fall um, so I just want to take you there a moment. It's uh, high in the rainforests in Peru. And uh, I was told about a missionary who liked nothing more than bombing up rivers where he'd been told that he could find uncontacted people, people because he wanted to convert them. History tells him he could be a killer Indigenous campaigners begged him not to do this because his contact could bring deadly diseases. And after one such contact a few years ago, I was told that 50% of a tribe had died. And then some people said to me when I was there, you should go and talk to Tarzan. Ask him about the missionaries. And of course, that's a bit of an irresistible invitation when somebody says, you should go and talk to Tarzan. He was a Harakambut man in his 90s, probably the only man in the world called Tarzan who'd never seen a Tarzan film in his life. But he remembered the time when the missionaries first came to his lands. The missionaries, he said, came in a plane which we thought was a huge and frightening eagle of a type we'd never seen before. We fled to the hills. Every day the missionaries came searching for us and when the plane saw us it flew very low, which was all the more frightening. The plane dropped machetes and sweets and clothes and mirrors. It frightened us. We didn't use them. We tried to sow the sweets like seeds, but of course they never grew. The missionaries set up a mission station and a school we were scared and threatened by them, said Tarzan. No one wanted to go to school, and anyway, after the missionaries came, our children died. We learned things, though, he said. We learned money and Spanish and work, and we learned that we had to work for money for needs we didn't have before. Why were we civilized? For what were we civilized? To be taught that we need markets more and more. So what of culture here? Forest law, shamanic knowledge, is an entire way of knowing. It's as beautiful, as profound as any in the West. A curandero is a qualified doctor, a shaman is a professor, a grove is a university library. The Amazon has its artists, its John Clares, its Mozarts, Plato's, Debussy's and Ovid's. The Amazon is a forest of knowing. With climate change though, a four degree rise in the Earth's average temperature would kill off 85% of the Amazon rainforest. Even a 2% rise, widely seen as unavoidable, will see 20 to 40% of it die. Cultures extinct. So kill pity. Crack down on kindness. 
pour mercury over metaphor burn their books, hack down their languages, and axe their philosophies, to Agent Orange into the eyes of a forest Picasso, tie a Shakespeare's hands behind his back with razor wire, break Nureyev's ankles, stamp on Fontaine's feet, crack Joyce's head against a wall until the words whimper and fail him, daub graffiti over an El Greco, bulldoze the sculptures of Rodin, burn the entire Oxford English Dictionary, napalm the Berlin Philharmonic. When I was in the Amazon, I was told various stories of the origin of people's cultures, founded on a sense of sureness that as it was in the beginning, so it will be forever. And the more you think about it, whichever cultures you know, the more you see that cultures always seem to have done this. Most stories of origin describe a world which, once created, is fixed, it's static, it's immutable. So in Greek myth, for instance, the world is formed out of chaos by the deities of Gaia and Uranus, who created form and order, natural law. In Egyptian myth, Kepri creates land with its foundation in mud, which is law, order, stability. These beliefs really interest me because they must, at some level, surely have encouraged the human mind to, insist, to an insistence that climate is one of the immutable things. Yes, we have flux in weather. Yes, we have floods. Yes, we have seasonality. But an essential changelessness in climate. And in my view, the human mind is made secure by that sense of some overarching sky, some overarching system which is fixed by nature or the gods. But in our age, that sense of the overarching sky, that system which seems immutable, is seen not as nature, but as the economic system. The natural world does not hold the attention of the dominant culture. Rather, the economy and commerce does, the media, consumerism. And I think perhaps one of the reasons why this society finds it so hard to address climate chaos is because the natural world's fixedness, its immutability, its stability, has been replaced by a demand that the artificial world of the economy must be fixed and stable. The pseudo-climate of the economic system is given the attention which the real climate needs. And that ancient belief that the whatever it is that surrounds humanity must be constant has been transferred from nature to the system. Most cultures over history have not known the principle that cultures can fail. And as I said earlier, our culture is unusual in its knowledge that they can and do. But our culture now becomes unique for a further reason. It's the only culture which has ever known not only the principle that civilizations can fall, but has also got the information that it will itself falter and perhaps fail. And for exactly what reason? The graphs of Thousands of diligent choir scientists are noting it. The interpretations of long history and the use of fossil fuels is telling us this. We know the principle from the past. We know the prognosis for the future. We're unique in being able to foretell our future, not from augury, but from science. And we are, collectively, uniquely stupid. We know this, and we deny it. And I doubt that anyone here would be daft enough to deny the solid consensus of science on this. And I don't think I'd be alone in saying that it disgusts me that the media have used their power to promote the idiot deniers and undermine for a decade the chances of strong, urgent action. A million murderous media decisions, some grotesquely large in national newspapers, some as tiny as sharing and reposting denialist bilge on the internet. 
a multitude of spite on comment threads and websites around the world levelled against those who would write or speak about climate change. No one saw that coming 20 years ago to adapt the words of Steve Waters. We made the mistake of thinking the truth was its own ambassador. It's a fabulous line, I'm going to say that again. We made the mistake of thinking the truth was its own ambassador. The media's power to misinform the public over climate change ought to be seen as an issue which damages both culture in the wider sense and democracy itself more hideously than anything else I can think of. Because democracy is not just voting, it is informed voting. And missing, misinforming the public over something of this magnitude is frankly criminal. In that delightful game of, if I ruled the world, I would give the editorship of all media outlets to climate scientists. Because the media is, in my view, responsible for an enormous part of the worldwide failure to act. But I have to confess, I'm going to take a drink of water. But I have to confess that I am a climate denier in a subtler sense. And it may surprise you that I say this, so I will quickly explain why I say it as I do. Some people, including Bruno Latour, writing on climate change, have commented that all those who don't deeply, profoundly, fully comprehend climate change, who do not truly think accordingly or act accordingly, are, in effect, deniers of its monumental import. And I have to put my hand up to that. I do try fairly feebly to limit taking flights. I do try a little more successfully to travel by train rather than by car. And I fail completely at living without much heating because I'm practically allergic to being cold. I've written a little, and certainly with feeling, about climate change over the last 20 years, but my attention has always been held by subjects I prefer. I want to be a good messenger in my age, and I am not, because this is a truth that I would prefer not to fully see, so I am colluding in the denial. And while I'm introducing a little more subtlety into ideas, I want to introduce a little more subtlety into the ideas of cultures falling and civilizations ending. Of course, it isn't binary. Our culture will not exactly either fall or survive. Rather, it will be something which is damaged, ravaged, irrevocably altered. We will lose much, far, far too much. And for millions of people the world over, with the combination of climate chaos, drought, disease, and mass migration, the be-all and end-all will be survival rather than culture. When I began writing, like most writers, I found it a profound consolation to know that my books would exist somehow, somewhere, for any foreseeable length of time. And now, inevitably, I wonder how libraries would be protected when there are wars for water. I wonder how books will fare when people like me, allergic to cold and with no source of energy, might look at a book as fuel for a necessary fire. My book, Wild, took seven years to write. Each copy might provide heat for seven minutes if you burn it. So far, so bleak. But what is culture, anyway? For far too long, our society has deemed culture to be the opposite of nature. It bores me senseless, that argument. The very etymology of the word culture is derived from cultus, the rituals around the cultivation of plants. Culture is embedded in nature. And our invasive culture has denied the culture of others. Our culture has long operated a kind of intellectual apartheid, arrogantly certain that its own expertise is the only knowledge worth the name, <coughs> cannot manage to respect other human societies' epistemologies, let alone accept 
that an animal might think. In the days of empire, that single way of knowing invaded the wild world. And as it did so, it claimed that it was an age of discovery and an expansion of the known world. The false claims of European history that knowledge increased in that era, it did not. The truth was rather the opposite. For the invading states, the church, the extraction industries whose paths they greased combined to destroy human cultures and animals' habitat, there was in fact a net reduction in the world's knowledge. <coughs> it's very much thanks to this conference that I came across Jonathan Lear's book, Radical Hope, which um, I think many of you have read looking around for nods, maybe, or will read. Um, it tells the story of Plenty Koo, who was a chief of the Crow Nation at a time of cultural destruction. As a child of nine, Plenty Koo went out on a dream quest, and he was shown how to take the chickadee as his role model. He was told to use the intelligence, the culture of nature, to navigate a way of possibility when your world is under siege. He was given the chickadee as a medicine dream, giving powerful insight into the future. To survive, he was told, meant to take those qualities, being least in strength but strongest in mind, willing to work for wisdom being a good listener, nothing escapes the ears of the chickadee, which he's sharpened by constant use. And Jonathan Lear writes, Plenty Coup had a radical hope that constituted courage and made it possible. I think for myself, one of the ways that if I were to look for that sense of a medicine dream, to look for that point in nature, that gives me a sense of radical hope. It has to be in the sense of wildness. This is not a wildness which is a kind of savage chaos. It's a wildness which has a freedom within a much greater law, and that sense of law is something I'm gonna come back to. When I wrote Wild, I very much wanted to talk to indigenous people who are the greatest protectors of wilderness places and wild lands. I wanted to ask them about the wilds and wild law. And mostly, of course, if I asked these dwellers of the land what they thought about wildness and wilderness, they called it simply home. And that was one of the feelings that I had in a lot of these places in the Amazon, in the Arctic, in Australia, that I felt homesick for wildness. When I found it, I knew how intimately, how resonantly I belonged there. Because we all do. For the human spirit has a primal allegiance to wildness, to really live, to snatch the fruit and suck it, to spill the juice. And this is the first command, to live in fealty to the feral angel. It's politically incredibly important for indigenous societies to lay claim to that term indigenous for themselves, to try to fight back for their land above all, the forces that have been ranged against them for hundreds of years. And I have to say it completely sickens me that the term indigenous is misused and stained by the far right in Britain now, because it steals from us all a term which opens pathways to hope in the human heart, to be an indigenous human being, indigenous to this wild earth. Nothing to do with race and bloodline, everything to do with love. When I was traveling for a while, I saw many communities who had been very badly damaged by the intrusions of Western culture. And I heard the same story from the ghettos of Southern Africa, I heard it, 
in the deserts of central Australia, I heard it, in the Arctic, I heard it, that the young people especially were dangerous to themselves and others. They were alcoholic, suicidal, they were violently out of control, that they lived in a kind of wasteland of the mind. It was a chaos of social climate. And in Africa, Australia and the Arctic, I heard people telling me the one and only solution, the land. Yolnu people in Australia call the land mind medicine. An Inuit musician I met in the Arctic who glories in the name Jimmy Echo said, violence comes from being outside nature. Another Inuk man, Joseph Kuno, said, alone on the land you can feel freedom. Anyone can. You feel your own freedom. One of the places that I went to was West Papua. And uh, there's been a genocide going on there for some 50 years. But somehow even a genocide which has killed thousands upon thousands of people doesn't seem to quite quench people's spirits. And when I was walking in the highlands, I had guides with me for a long walk of many, many days. And as we walked, they would sing the song of the land that we were going through. They just were making them up at every point. They made up the story of the land, the story of what happened. And it's a skill that they share with many Papuan people. There was one song that was really making them laugh a lot. So I said, look, that one, can you translate that one for me? And they looked a bit embarrassed because some of the guys were really young, they were about 17. And, uh, and they said, um, that one is, we met the girls in grass skirts today. Way! Hey. <laughs> I thought, bless, something's never changed today. But it's as if everywhere you go in West Papua, there are lines of songs, not exactly like the famous song lines of Australia, but a version of it. And I think if you listen in a certain way, you could say that the whole world is told in song. In the Amazon, shamans are singers of the song lines. In the jungles, the drum. Their songs are ethereal, they're quiet, almost to inaudibility, sometimes whistle, sometimes voiced. A shaman in trance often draws on a reefer of pure tobacco and whistles out the smoke so you can almost see the shape of the melody in the smoke he breathes. They say that the songs themselves can heal, consoling the mind, creating harmony. And music and health both depend on harmony as humanity has long known. In Australia, the song lines are a guide to the land. You learn them in order to travel the land. The song lines in the Amazon are a guide to the mind. Each plant, say shamans, has its own song. To use that plant, you must learn its song. And the songs come to you in dreams. They're a guide, a map, not of landscape, but a map of knowledge scape. There is a practical wisdom here, but also a psychological wisdom. You find your way. You learn how to live unlost, not through the wild forest, but within it. And you can know where you are through music, along the song lines. In Australia, a song line will describe, for instance, the possum ancestor traveling from three big rocks and over a creek bed. The line of the story will describe the lie of the land. People can even travel across country they've never seen before, provided they know the song. It will guide them like a map. Song for indigenous Australians is a treasured possession giving meaning to land and individual life. It's a map, a way of thinking. But crucially, it's a form of order. The song lines and the story they contain are part of law, with a capital L-A-W. For stories illustrate morality. They're like parables knitted into the land, telling people how they should act. And this idea of the law in the land, a way of doing things, an ethic, a responsibility, is a very common feature of indigenous cultures. And if you ask me in one word what the fastest and best way of dealing with climate change is, I have to say law. 
international law, national law. The, impl the implementation of some fierce, brutal seeming legislation which makes it illegal to produce more fossil fuels which severely curtails their use. And I cannot help but see in the situation we ourselves face a kind of inverse of indigenous law. Because if indigenous law typically tries to protect nature, though it doesn't always succeed, modern law sets out to protect property and profit at the expense of the natural world. If indigenous law typically sets out a way of acting which has an inherent sense of environmental responsibility, our society's law is barely skimming the surface of environmental protection and is hopelessly inadequate when it comes to climate chaos. When Native American people famously included animals in their decision-making about the future, asking at a council meeting, who speaks for wolf? Our society has trouble even listening to the rights of our own children, the needs of our own grandchildren. And ours is, in a radical sense, an unkind society. And one thing which, to me, became more and more apparent in my journeys was how the way of the wild is kind. What is controlled and unfree becomes nasty. What is most caged is most cruel. If you want to make an animal cruel, put it in a cage. Kind is related to the word kin, and we are kin animals, kindled in a wild kindness. That is the kind love which cannot tolerate the extinctions of species or cultures. That is the ferocious love which fights to spare. And these are the ethics which speak to me of hope, an ethic of kindness, of harmony, of song, of law, translated fiercely sometimes tenderly at others. It's an attitude of mind, a sensibility of listening. It is an ethic of alignment, aligning the human self with the way of the wild, with the culture of nature, with the law of the land and the intelligence of wild things. We were made to walk through our lives <coughs> wildly awake, our minds mobile, quick, changeable. We all are mercurial, our minds as winged as our feet. To be a nomad in one's mind is in our gift, to move and learn, to be a student always, leaving behind some rock of certainty, letting the mind wander and wonder till it surprises itself. In wildness is our self-willed, self-governing freedom, and such wild freedom blossoms within us. It bubbles over with an anarchic ivoresce of feeling. We glint when the wild light shines because we are animal in our blood and in our skin. We were not born for pavements and escalators, but for thunder and mud. We are animal not only in body, but in spirit. Our minds are the minds of wild animals, sniffing a quick, wild scent in the air. What is wild cannot be bought or sold, borrowed or copied. It is unmistakable unforgettable, unshameable, elemental. We come from that wild song. In music was the creation of the universe. And we're most fully alive when we resonate to its wildest pitch with intense and necessary love. In jaguar forests or deserts or mountains or the lands of essential ice or the water which first coaxed the story. And humanity's highest purpose, now as never before, is to be fluent in the streaming cadences of all our world's languages, making our earth more vivid, realizing it in song. For that is how the spirit, deep within all life, leaves the unforgeable signature of its wild authenticity in the songlines of this 
wild world. <coughs> Thank you.